Hello and welcome to another edition of Tough Talk. My name is Roy Lilly and my guest today is Dr Claire Girarda, who is the chairman of the Royal College of GPs and a practising GP. Yes, good A evening. real live working GP. I am GP. a real live working GP. Okay, and have you got plenty of flu jabs? That's uh, we, the only question we want the answer to. We are actually to. in short supply at the moment. Really? Yeah, we have, uh, we have a, a number of our patients in the at-risk group who haven't yet been immunised and we can't. We hopefully will get some, some flu jabs by the end of the week. I just hope your practice manager isn't watching this because they're not going to be pleased with you. But you are in Kennington, which is Kennington in London, mm -hmm. which is an interesting place. On, on the one hand, you've got Walcott Square and all the rest mm -hmm. of it, which is the sort of perfume triangle in which mm -hmm. many GPs have their apartments, lavishly furnished on the John Lewis list at public expense, no doubt. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you've got uh, Kennington Oval, the cricket mm -hmm. ground, and uh, I presume you get lots of free tickets, and uh, they should everyone should email you for a free ticket. Well, that, actually, uh, Roy, I'm actually the honorary medical director, honorary medic for Surrey County Cricket Ground, and though personally I have very little interest in cricket, I do get access to tickets. I have to say, though, we moved to Kennington because my husband is a passionate supporter of cricket, so he has first call on these. He tickets. sounds like a good man, but perhaps he needs someone to carry the. Hampton, Maybe. Hampton, I'll let you know. Hampton's the cricket. And the other sort of interesting thing about it is it is Kennington is a wealthy place on the one hand, but on the other hand at the Vauxhall end running down through to Kennington mm. and Brixton and so on, that's, that's a socially deprived area. What, what's your practice like? Well, it's an extraordinary practice. I practice predominantly in, in, in a clinic near the Elephant and Castle, so it's actually in Kennington, but it's a bottom two storeys of a 17-storey block. 90% of our patients could roughly be described as socially deprived, and the remaining 10% middle class with a, with a tiny proportion, but a significant small proportion of MPs, lords, and very, very affluent people living in some of the, the squares. So could you get a lord and a drug addict in the We have the often got, I mean the extraordinary thing about general practice is that you don't tend to use private GPs. I mean people might use private health care if they're, they're wealthy but they use an NHS GP so we will have and have had many times uh, a lord and lady or an MP sitting next to one of my drug using patients. So it, it is a strange uh, place to work. It's a wonderful place to work. I sometimes describe, and this is an absolute true story, my first night on call uh, as a GP registrar, where I had two home, three home visits, two of them were to MPs, and one to, was to somebody who was actually squatting in one of the local flats. I thought this is how it would always be. I mean, it's, that's quite an extraordinary night, but it is a, a, a wonderful place to work. Very, very, very rich in diversity. Mm. and. You are, are you the second woman to have been the chair of the RCG or, or, or in modern times or the first, I think? No, I'm the second woman to have been chair of the RCGP. The first one right. uh, was back in 1959, uh, Dr Gilly, who was, uh, was both chair and president, and she was actually the second chair. Uh, so, yes, taken us 50 odd years to get another one. And that was when GPs were GPs and not process managers and rationers as they are now. Yeah, that's the start of the modern age of general practice, when the GP lived in their community, was part of the, the community involvement, where, where they were well known, where they worked incredibly hard doing, uh, basically probably doing, and I've, I've evidence for this, of up to 60 patients a day and 30 home visits uh, a day. So extraordinary different way of working. And changed hugely now, yes. and and let's face it, will change hugely again. It has changed hugely. We've still got the same basic tenets of general practice, though. We've still got a registered population. We still provide care across a whole population, right from cradle to grave. Uh, we work in the community. We have multidisciplinary teams, much more now than certainly in the 1950s. But general practice today, other than some of the, the, the size and maybe the complexities of the IT system, is recognisable to the general practice that we had in the 1950s. It is, and perhaps that's part of the problem, uh, in that we are still, we meaning me, the, the punter, the public, are still enslaved to a GP. I've still got to register with a GP. and It might be hugely inconvenient if I'm a commuter and you know, you're not open when I come home and, and why should you? Because you can't work 24 hours a day. I mean, ha haven't we got to the point really where the solution to a lot of the problems of the NHS would be to see the list go and just let people go to any GP, martini style, any time, any place, anywhere? I think the strength of general practice is its list. I think if you... Well, why? why well, let it? me explain why it is. I think, number one, 
I think if you find it difficult to access your GP, then solutions can be found. So if you're a, 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 a journalist who leaves home at 6 a.m. in the morning, you can't. then we can sort that out. We can sort it out with homeless people. We can sort it out with students who travel from one part to the other. But let's not dismantle what makes the NHS. What can but it, well, no, hang on. It's, I mean, it's not important to me. Which, well, it, it, which doctor? Well, it I is. See. It might. I don't want to be patronising. It may not be important to you because you may not have to access healthcare on a regular basis. It certainly would be important to someone who had a chronic, complex disease. It certainly would be important. And let them do it. Let them do it. The problem is. But and, why should I have to do it? Because they need to do well, it. Well, as I said, you don't have to do it. If there is, if you cannot. But I do, access... Claire. If I get up and I go to work in London in the morning, I get on a train with two thousand people and and go to Waterloo. Uh, those 2,000 people have not had a chance to see their GP. When I get to Waterloo, there are a quarter of a million other people who haven't had a chance to see their GP. You can't fix that unless you get the chance to walk into any GP, any time, um, any place, anywhere. Like, it's like saying, I can only go to Sainsbury's in Camberley in Surrey because that's where I live. Right. It's balmy. You, there are all sorts of methodological problems about having vast numbers of the population being able to register with any GP. Number one is planning. How do you plan local health services if you don't know what your bottom line is going to be? The other is continuity of care. The other is, and we know this, is the fact that patients who drop in on, their, on, on doctors may actually have underlying problems you need in essence the NHS works well because we provide continuity of care through a registered list and using a, 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 a medical record that takes you through your whole your whole health journey exceptions can be made and I've already said there's exceptions my son is a student. He sometimes finds it difficult. So he, he solutions can be made. Okay, but to so have piecemeal destruction, it. Right. it can be fixed. There's also, I would challenge you that you can't make an appointment with your GP. I would challenge you that you couldn't ring up your GP and make a telephone consultation. We offer, at our practice, email, text, telephone, face-to-face, -face, home visiting. We have a, a registered population who, we, who stay with us, number move on, who we provide comprehensive health care to over, a, over a, a long period of time. I think many people feel this, that if you lose that, if you lose the registered list, you've actually lost, in a sense, any form of coordination uh, okay. across the health service. But we are going to lose, aren't we, now with the, the, uh, the changes that are being uh, brought about by the coalition we are going to change. We are going to see a fundamental change in relationship with our GP. I mean, there was a time when I'd come to you, and you'd say, "Roy, you need uh, something or other, a pill or what have you, that the PCT won't pay for." But I'm going to go to the PCT and I'm going to fight for it and get it for you. Yes. You go to the PCT. You may lose, but you're still my friend. You're still my GP. You're still my advocate. You mm. know, my person in the in the know. Now, with the, what's being proposed, with a budget holder, you're going to say to me, "Roy, you." You need this pill, but you know what? You can't have it, and uh, I'm not prepared to pay for it. Yes, I mean, what you're alluding to is uh, the inherent conflicts of interest that are being introduced through the, the, the reforms that are, are, are just about to see the legislation on. You're also uh, alluding to the, the role of NICE, because at the moment NICE makes those decisions for us. My sense is we're going to have to make this work, because actually we can't have a situation where the GP is being placed in such an invidious position as having to refuse at the point of the consultation what the patient may need, uh, in, irrespective of the price. I don't know how it's going to pan out. My sense is uh, solutions are going to have to be found. We wait to see what the bill says about, uh, about value-based pricing, about uh, the governance structures within GP consortia. Well, that, that, that doesn't matter. You're still, going to, you'll still be the person that says no. We're still the person that says no. Uh, yes, I mean, it, clearly we're still the person that says no, and I am concerned and I have voiced my concerns at putting the GPs where, in where an invidious position. Where do you position. sit with this? I mean, we've seen the BMA. Uh, we interviewed Lawrence Buckman um, mm. uh, a few sessions ago, and uh, I, I sense the RCGP is in the same kind of fix that the BMA is in. Uh, it, that it, I think it would like to say we do not want to engage with this change because we don't think it's a good idea. But the trouble is some of our sort of more gung-ho members have gone on and they're doing it already. So we, who do we represent? Uh, uh, you know, I can't figure out. I mean, what is the position of the RCGP? Well, I'll tell you what the position is. We welcome GPs and other clinicians being placed in, in the planning of local health services. Right, and then cut, stop... Play that piece of tape, Andrew Lansley will say, see, the RCGP are all for what I want to do. Yeah, and we have but I sense there's a but coming. 
There is a but, and we have serious concerns that despite uh, Mr Lansley's uh, reassurance that uh, I mean, he, he says, and we applaud this, that he puts the patient at the centre of healthcare, that he's about choice. Well, he can hardly say anything else, can he? We, are, we, have, we have concerns that when the reforms get played out, that we haven't actually seen any evidence that that is actually going to happen. And in fact, our concerns from the, the college are very specific concerns. We're, we are concerned that we're looking at the fragmentation of the NHS. We are concerned that we're going to be increasing costs through transaction costs. And we are concerned that through the choice agenda, we're actually going to lead with, to, to, to further ramifications of the inverse care law and, and the p patients who need the NHS most are actually not going right. to be. Right, and their concerns that are expressed, really, in fairness to Lawrence Buckman, the BMA have, mm. have, have said that. Uh, most of the Royal Colleges have said that. Certainly Royal College of Nursing have said that. Peter Carter said mm. it in a Tough Talk uh, interview. Um, nearly all of the... Uh, the think tanks have said it. Uh, the King's Fund have come very close to to condemning the uh, the reform. I mean, I, I in fairness and, and as a journalist, I've I've tried to put some balance into into what we do, certainly with our our newsletter. But it's almost impossible to find anyone who's got a balanced argument and says, Do you know what, Roy? This is actually a good idea. Everybody says it's a bad idea. Well, I. I, I, in, in a similar vein, I mean, I, my post bag is full. Most people who write to me, from my members, are expressing concerns. They, the concerns get more subtle as they begin to understand what the issues are. So, for example, the tariff. We now are going to see uh, uh, no floor to the tariff. Therefore, we're actually going to be seeing a competition based not just on quality but on price. And a rush to the bottom. Possibly a rush to the bottom, but certainly uh, there will be uh, organisations that will be able to offer, for example, cold surgery at a much cheaper price. But maybe that's a good thing. Well, it isn't a good thing. Maybe a it could a be done at a, a time a in a place that's good. A hospital is a very, very complex system where parts of one part of activity will subsidise another part of activity. If you remove some of the activity is actually going to be siphoned off at a lower cost right outside, then you will probably have to increase the price, the tariff of other activity, or you will have to remove that activity altogether. A hospital like the NHS is incredibly complicated. And I would worry about having price being part of, of, of a quality agenda because I don't believe except in maybe exceptional circumstances, that if you remove uh, the, the, a bottom on price, that you will get better quality. But the common law of business logic is the, the, the competition improves quality and gets a reasonable handle on price. Uh, the well, NHS I, I, isn't... Uh, I'm not an economist. I'm, I'm a doctor. Uh, from everything I've seen, as I said to you, number one, hospitals are complex. Number two, parts of a, a, one part of a service will be subsidising another part of the service. And number three, I, I do have concerns about cherry picking and leaving the NHS to actually deal with, with more and more complex patients with the same conditions. So are you worried about the, the substance of the reform or, or, or the pace of change? OK, uh, th let's be, right, I'm going to be fair now. I think there are some parts of the reform that actually we should be applauding. And I don't mean this just in sort of a, a, you know, a platitude. I think it is good to have a look at the system. I think it's, it is good to say what's wrong with the NHS currently. Yes, it's been around since 1948, yes. and there are two arguments. You say it's been around since 1948, it's served us well, don't muck around with it. Or you say, I can't think of another business that's been around since, since 1948 that hasn't changed. Yeah. Banks have changed. Yeah. You know, all, so why should the NHS... Why should the NHS? Yeah. So I would be more in favour of incremental changes. I would be more in favour so of managing... So it's the pace of change. It's the pace of change. But I've just let's go back to where I think we need to be looking at where things may have gone wrong. I think we need to get accountability back into the NHS. I think we need to get accountability... What does that mean? Well, I think we need to know what we're spending on behalf of our patients. I think we... We know that. Well, we don't. I don't think... When you say we, do you mean GPs? Um, GPs, hospital doctors, nurses. I think we need to be accountable. We need to put patients back... At but the if you do that, then then if, if, if a GP's aware of his budget and I'm coming in at the, at the end of the financial year and he takes a one look at me and thinks, geez, I'm going to defer an operation here because, ka I'm going to explode my budget with another hip operation. Well, that's, that's not, not that, good, That's what it? I'm not addressing. That's what I'm not talking about. What I'm talking about, accountability, is actually with clinicians working together, putting the patients and not the provider unit... No. No, in the no, accountability for, for a budget puts the clinician first.
costs because the clinician says, you say the clinician, you are responsible for this budget, do not overspend. He then finds himself in a situation where he, he does the right thing for the finances and not the right thing for the customer. Where I'm talking about ac accountability is I'm actually talking about accountability with respect to looking at care pathways, keeping patients out of hospital, looking at variable performance uh, um, amongst all doctors, all nurses, looking at joint working, looking at moving care to where the patient needs the care, looking at actually having hospitals that are good enough working towards excellence everywhere. And I think what's happened over the last 20 years is actually we're focusing much more on targets, we're focusing much more on the organisation, the structures, rather than, and, and this again isn't a platitude, rather than the patient in the middle and how it works. Examples I've seen and from what I've read overseas, including the United States, show that you can deliver a very, very high quality service, not at an exorbitant price. In fact, some of the, the HMOs in the States, the better HM, HMOs, are cheaper because they have accountability, they have leadership, effective leadership within their systems, and they have good clinician to clinician dialogues. What's gone out, certainly even since I've been a GP, I don't talk to any consultants. It, it's gone. I used to be walking into, into my local, wasn't called a trust then, my local hospital most days of the week to go to clinical meetings, to meet consultants, to do visits on patients. It's virtually unheard of now to get a, to get a move of hospital consultants out of the community or for me to walk into my hospital. And, and you're describing a, a, a very sophisticated approach to general practice. And one wonders really, and I'm not being disrespectful to GPs, but one wonders really if, if that's really either within their capability to do or whether or not they even want to do it. I mean, the GPs are fundamentally the corner shops of the NHS. Um, they, they provide a, a, an important local service. And to call them the corner shop is not to be disparaging, but they are the corner shops of the NHS. Now, can you expect the corner shops of the NHS to work at this sort of sophisticated level of budgetary awareness, governance <coughs> and all the rest of it? Isn't it a, a bridge too right, far? I'm not talking about budgetary awareness. But what I'm saying then with respect to the, the previous conversation, it's actually... I think GPs are the best place. GP, the, the, the changes, the incremental changes, the innovation have, have come from clinicians, both out in hospitals and also yes, in general Yes, they might be the best place, but what I'm saying is, are the mainstream capable of doing that? Are capable of handling £70 to £8 billion pounds worth of money? Yeah. Uh, I would, I think, scaling up from a GP practice to managing 70 to 80 billion pounds of, of NHS money, there, of course, are concerns about that. I don't think running the health service is the same as running your surgery. I would hope, and in fact it has to happen, that they will be getting in excellent managers. I would hope those would be NHS managers who already have the training, the expertise, the, the, the history of working within this very, very complex system, where, again, I'm not an economist, but where dealing with a patient in need is not the same as going and buying a tin of baked beans in Sainsbury's and I would hope that that's what my colleagues will do because it's complex. If PCT managers haven't got this right, I don't think they haven't got this well, right because they haven't tried. Is, is that fair? Well, I mean, they, some of them have got it right, but a lot of them did get it right. It, it's a testimony to the fact how complicated it is, mm. that the fact that, that it didn't come right immediately. But some of the outcome data towards the end of the PCT's life was actually showing that world-class commissioning was working, they were getting to grips with it, and it is complex. And it was interesting when you said, you know, I hope they'll be getting in professional managers to help them do it. Well, you're just going to reinvent the PCT. And I, th I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I, let's, from what you've just said, I think PCTs were getting it right towards the end. Now, I've been around long enough that I've now seen, in, even in my relatively short life as a GP, about six major reorganisations. And we know that there's been 15 major reorganisations in the NHS in England. I think PCTs were getting it right. I think we certainly know that cancer improvement, stroke improvement, my, uh, many people have said this, and I'm not the first to say it, I would have thought the one solution would be to merge PCTs, get rid of the PEC, put GPs and other clinicians in the majority of the board. Together you've, you've kept the corporate memory, scale down the amount of management you've got within PCTs, put a cap on manager, management uh, uh, costs, and there you go. I and many others cannot understand why we are dismantling the architecture of the NHS in order to some would say, start again where we are now, but three to four years down the line. I suppose there are, there are two schools of thought on change, aren't there? There's the incremental change 
uh, and there's the throw it all up in the air and see what comes down change. And, and I, I mean, one wonders really, I mean, Andrew Lansley, uh, who is the author of this, we're given to believe, has, he spent six years in opposition, studying the NHS and travelling around. His wife is a GP. Uh, I mean, one wonders, what do you think it is that he, that, that he found so uh, inefficient or, or he, he felt that he was just incapable of keeping in place? To, instead of this, we've got this demolition job and it, it will be well beyond 2015 before the thing is up and running and then it'll be another four or five years before we know if it works or not. When we've got really your three-step solution, you know, mm. uh, managers out, docks in and cost cap, mm. uh, which is a, you know, a, a simple solution. I mean, what, you speak to him in your role as chair of the RCGP, what's your sense of, of why, we, why are we in this mess? Well, I suspect that, like many politicians, he means things for the best. I, I, I think you know, they want, politicians want to make a difference. You've asked what he saw that wasn't working. Well, maybe what he saw that wasn't working were PCTs, because if you look four years ago, three years ago, PCTs were very clunky organisations, very top-heavy with, with management, and it was very difficult as a GP to, to, to get PCTs to actually understand that we had a role to play. So maybe that's what he saw. You said, should you throw it up in all the air or do an incremental change? I am actually struck by the success of the Scottish Health Service. Now, Scotland, not that long ago, was, was in the doldrums in terms of health outcomes. It has quietly and systematically risen up the ladder in terms of survival rates, in terms of addressing health inequalities. And when you look and think, well, why might that be? You could say that they haven't had a major reorganisation since 1987 and you could also say that what they do is that they have incremental change. Clinicians and managers working to sort out things that are wrong because the NHS has problems. It isn't an ideal, you know, how mm. can it be? It's an enormous, enormous system. It's not perfect. And Scotland's got the fabulous Harry Burns who is a clinician running He's a it. clinician but, you know, we, we, we've had, there are good clinicians running and working within management structures. There's excellent managers. I think what's happened, and again I speak personally, rather than as the chair of the Royal College of GPs, I have seen the demolition year on year of reorganisations of the structures that we have. And to me, it's an, the analogy I use, it's like pulling out the plant, having a look at its roots, and then whacking it back down again. Instead of, and carrying forward that analogy, you've got a forest, you've got to trim the weeds of the forest, you've got to cut things, things down, sometimes you've got to pull out bits of the forest, but you have the forest that grows, that sustains. Now that might be an ideological view, but no sooner do you get a, some change, no sooner do you get some expertise in the staff that you're working, no sooner do you know the people that you're working, they disappear. What I'm worried about this time is there's a slow burn of them disappearing because the, the managers that are, are left are actually signing their own uh, redundancy notices in yes. two years' time. How on earth can these poor people give all their energy and support when that's what they're doing? They're on a two-year trial uh, knowing that on, on, on every, you know, they're in a sense blamed for what's going on. And I've had managers in tears saying, it's not me, I tried my best. And I think you ask what's in Lanz Andrew, uh, Lanzi's mind, in the Secretary of State's mind, I don't know. I, I think he's truly trying to do things for the best. He's probably listening to people who are a, a very pro-budget holding, very pro... Well, they're, they're the rump of the fund holders, aren't they? And organisations like the National Association of Primary Care and others who are, who are up for this... Uh, one wonders really if, if it, it, very bright people who are, you've got to be very bright to be a doctor and very yes. bright people just don't get bored with mumps and measles and they have to go off and run NASA or something. Well again, and you've touched on something that I, I think no one has really thought about, the opportunity cost to my profession. We're, we're going to be removing 2%, 3% of, in a sense, excellent GPs to, to run this. That probably translates to two or three medical schools that have to be built. Not all the doctors from those medicals could become GPs in order to fill their places to allow these GPs to be doing that. And that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be participating in the planning of local health services. Absolutely they shouldn't be. 
But there are opportunity costs on this. There, the well, not least to the poor old punter who turns up to see their favourite Dr Smith only to be told you're, told you're seeing a locum because Dr Smith is away waging war at the cutting edge of medicine with a ginger biscuit and a cup of tea at a meeting. Well, you can say that. I hope they wouldn't be doing that. But again... Well, it's true, isn't I it? Think, they well, can't I be think, in two places I, at once. I think GPs, and I'm an innovator, I've set up a number of services. I set up a shared care service. I set up a mental health service. What we are is we are a sense, is we have ideas. Uh, we love to get together. We love to provide. And then we have very sensible managers who come in place and say, yep, this idea will work. We need to write a business case and etc. So I have no doubt that GPs can play their part. My concern is, as many people's concern, is that we've got a three to four year planning blight. We're, we're, we're losing our NHS managers. It's costing a vast amount of money. I've heard estimates of three to four billion pounds to, to, to turn this around. In a way, to start to, to, to reach a place where we probably are already. And so by I don't know, where are we now? 2011, let's give it three years, where, four years. Where, do you, where, will, where will we be? Well, let's, let's, go to the end of the, let's go to the election, 2015. Will, will we be oven ready and uh, shovel ready and <laughs> up and running and built and finished in time, I suppose, for the coalition to say, didn't we do a good job? I think, do you think that's possible? I think the coalition has to be mindful that we're also doing this at a time of having to make £20 billion worth of savings. I would be concerned if I was in the government that actually the increase in waiting times, the, the queues in A&E, will actually start to hit in in two to three years' time. So they could be facing in a, 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 quote, winter of discontent election in the NHS. Are the wheels coming off, do you think? Well, I think certainly what we're looking at is, is having to make cuts at a time when we're actually, as I said, you know, moving the architecture of the NHS that, that's propping it up. I would have thought, and this is again, I'm not an economist, but I, am, I run a practice, if we're making major reorganisation within our practice, we have a very clear plan. We put in the best of our managers to do that, and we then follow through the plan. What we don't do is sack all of our managers, uh, move all the GPs up into making those decisions instead of seeing the patients, and then hope for the best. And so... Uh, it, it, there are some incongruences. Dr Gerardo, thank you very much for joining us on Tough Talk. You're running in the London Marathon, I think, are you this year? Y yes, I am running. Well, I'm hoping I've actually got a, a marathon injury. I've got a bursitis, so I'm using crutches at the moment, so I'm hoping to be able to recover and get back on training. If not, I'm going to have to postpone my marathon until next year. Well, we wish you good luck. And Dr Gerardo, thank you very much for being with us today. You've been watching Tough Talk with Roy Lilly and my guest... Dr. Claire Girardin.